Rebuilding a hope-filled future from the rubble of your present circumstances. Nehemiah chapter 2, let me just read to you, just follow along, 20 verses. I know that's a lot to read for a text, but it's, it's, it's not like reading Romans. It's not like deep theological, densely packed sentences. It's kind of a story, an account. So just kind of uh, keep your mind alert as I read. Nehemiah 2, 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes... So this is Babylonian captivity. That's where Nehemiah is. Some of the Jews have already gone back, some under Ezra, and worked on the temple and the rebuilding of the temple. There are some Jews already back in Jerusalem, but not all. The city is in disarray, and the walls around the city in particular are still down. In the 20th year, King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. You'll see why in a minute. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. And then I was very much afraid. And I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And then the king said to me, what are you requesting? What do you want, Nehemiah? And so I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's grave, that's Jerusalem, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone? When will you return? And so it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. And then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite servant, heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem. I was there three days. I rose in the night, I and a few men with me, I told no one what God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. And I went out by night, so you could see him all by himself in the dark. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room. For the animal that was under me to pass, so much rubble, debris, things broken down. Then I went up in the night by the valley, inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. I had not told, not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were there to do the work. And then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins, with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. And so they strengthened their hands for a good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant of Geshem, the Arab, heard it. They jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And 
And I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. And so Jesus, just come and help us in these next few minutes to receive bread from the word that feeds our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're looking here at people who are miraculously brought back out of bondage into freedom. Babylonian captivity, back to their rightful place. The city of Jerusalem, the place where they belong. The work of restoration, as I said, had already begun. Some of the walls of the temple had been reconstructed by earlier groups of workers. It's, it's hard to get exact dates, but it's probable that sacrifices were once again being offered to God, the true God, in the temple. But the fact that the work had begun didn't mean there wasn't still much work to be done. So God had already brought some of them back. God had brought a measure of deliverance, and now they had to rebuild. It's one thing to be delivered. It's another thing to learn to live in new dimensions of freedom and grace, and to understand how God works and to walk in his ways. Deliverance doesn't automatically produce that. That's always the way God works. Redemption doesn't preclude reconstruction. Grace follows those who obey God's principles. God did love these people, and they were objects of his care and his restoring grace, but that didn't mean God just wanted to wave a magic wand over their heads, and automatically the walls of the city would go up, and everything would be rebuilt, and all their problems and opposition would go away. It doesn't work that way. He wanted them to learn having been delivered and received grace and his hand upon them, Nehemiah recognizes that. God still wants them to learn to order and rebuild their lives on his terms rather than their own. That's what we all do. That's process. They knew they had brought much of this rubble on themselves. Jerusalem was sacked by Nebuchadnezzar, the previous king, Babylon, because of the idolatry and disobedience of God's people. So they brought the mess on themselves, and they would continue to bring more on themselves if God didn't teach them how to rebuild their lives piece by piece according to his will. It's one thing to be forgiven. It's another thing to learn to order your lives around God's will and way. Those are two different things. We are redeemed people, but we're redeemed people who live in a fallen world. And each one deals with his or her own areas of brokenness and rubble and pride and stubbornness and rebellion, some corner of circumstance where things just don't automatically come together because God has forgiven us. And this should do for us what it did for Nehemiah. It should drive us not to despair, but it should drive us, as we looked last week, or the week before, rather, last week we had missions, the week before we started Nehemiah. It should drive us to fresh prayer and dependence on God. You probably forgot. You remember how long it said Nehemiah mourned and prayed and fasted and waited on God? Five months. Five months. So, as he waits those five months, several things begin to form in Nehemiah's soul as he just kind of percolates and thinks and prays in God's presence for almost half a year. And first, as we saw in that study, he, I believe it's online, you can listen or read the notes or whatever. First, he sees the terrible results of the people's sin. Why they're in the mess they're in. Because if you don't learn that, then you just repeat the same mistakes. Second, he begins to hunger for purity of worship and restoration with God. And third thing that we saw, he sees the need for his own involvement in confession, contrition, repentance, and the rebuilding process. That's kind of where we are. And now we're up to chapter 2. Knowing when the time is right for action. Look at those first three verses. They're really interesting. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up wine and gave it to the king. He's cupbearer to the king. 
He takes food. He takes wine. And it had better be good and not poisoned or anything else or he's in trouble. Gets, he gets a haircut but right about here. Took wine, gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad? You're not sick. This is just sadness of heart. What's making you so miserable? I was very much afraid. You don't, he doesn't know how this is going to go. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's grave, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? It's probably difficult for us to imagine how hard it must have been for Nehemiah to bide his time for five months. He hasn't said anything to anyone about this burden of his heart for his people and the city of Jerusalem. He's never said anything to the king, ever. In, in the King James, it's interesting, the old King James, it, it, it begins chapter 2 with those interesting little words, and it came to pass. And that about sums it up. Five months. You pray. You seek God. You think. You wait. You pray more. You watch. You serve. You, and, and you wait. And nothing seems to be happening. And nothing seems to be unraveling or unfolding. You see days go by. Weeks go by. Months go by as you continue to seek God. And it's easy to wrongly conclude that absolutely nothing of significance is taking place because you don't see it yet. And, and it came to pass. One day, something just comes to pass. Only it didn't just come to pass. A door opens. Circumstances somehow just shift a bit. You aren't doing anything different. You aren't praying any harder. You aren't holier. You don't feel like anything striking has happened, but, but God's timing. God puts his hand in it, and something, something just comes to pass. Those are wonderful words. There's a lot to learn from Nehemiah here. He really does two things at once. He prays. Five months. He prays and, and he watches. He intercedes and he thinks, and he's alert, and he's noticing what's going on. It's that wonderful combination that can be all too rare sometimes in the body of Christ. He's both anointed and he's wise. Nehemiah knows he can do the right thing at the wrong time, prays for five months. He knows he can wait too long, he can miss an opportunity, he knows he can blow it by rushing ahead too quickly. I think Nehemiah knows he's on thin ice here. Everything seems to hinge on Artaxerxes, the king. Now, Artaxerxes is not a godly man at all. He's an idolater. And Nehemiah's future is in his hands. That's why, that's why even in his praying, he's been careful. Nehemiah, very careful, very thorough. He knew a lot hinged on the king. And he knew the king could be a difficult issue. And he prayed. He prayed specifically about this problem, if you remember, two weeks ago. It's in 111 of Nehemiah. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant, grant him mercy in the sight of this man. This man is Artaxerxes. The servant is Nehemiah. Give to your servant, Nehemiah, success today. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man, Artaxerxes. I was cupbearer to the king. So Nehemiah prays, but he knows here's, here's the issue. The issue is Artaxerxes. And he thinks about that as he prays. So tonight, you know, we get together in our little groups. Pretty ordinary. We do it every Sunday night. And, and, and the, you know, the roof didn't shake. Anybody hear a mighty rushing wind? I didn't. 
How much does the prayer of one person do? When you're praying for something big. How do you measure the importance of one person's prayer? Well, you see, generations... Think about Nehemiah. Generations from this point in time for Nehemiah. Generations later, there will be people worshiping in the temple in Jerusalem. Generations from that time, children will play safely inside the walls of the city. And no one then is going to look back and dream that all of it was the result of this one man's prayer that his conversation with the king would be fruitful. But right there, right there, that's where it happened. One man, God, help me with Artaxerxes, who isn't Christian in any way. What are you getting at, Don? Well, in any situation where you are where I am, in any situation, the rebuilding and the work of God is not always obvious and it's not always spectacular. It's not always even immediate. But over time, over time, as you wait on God, a door opens. It came to pass. There's a point. One morning, something special happens. It didn't really seem like that big a deal at the time. Nehemiah always went before the king in the morning, every morning. The only thing different about this day was the king, the king takes some time to make small talk with Nehemiah. doesn't usually do that. Nehemiah takes the cup, takes it to the king. And the king says, you've been looking a little down lately. What's up, Nehemiah? There, that's it. History is going to change. You've been looking a little down. What's up? Everything Okay. Just a simple observation, small talk, simple question, nothing of weight, nothing of importance in that brief moment was very obvious, except to Nehemiah because he's been praying about Artaxerxes. You see what I mean? Nehemiah is alert. He prays and he watches. He prays and he watches. He's been doing that for five months. And today he prayed, and he's still watching, and bang, it starts to happen. How are you doing, Nehemiah? There was that little question that changed the nation's history, and because his heart had been so long tuned in to God in prayer, and because he was constantly alert, seeing how God might work, even though God hadn't done anything visible for half a year, Nehemiah sees something of an opportunity. Give him great credit. He's still, he's still ready for the door to open when it comes. He's still waiting there for the opportunity. We were kids. We used to go down the street. Thought we were terribly brilliant. We'd knock on doors and then take off. Very witty. Nehemiah, he's right there. Waiting for the opportunity. Praying all the time. He's looking for God to work. Which leads to the second point. The importance of praying without ceasing. Now look at 4 and 5. They follow those first three verses. The king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. I don't know about you, but one of the battles I face in my daily prayer life is the accusation, I know where it comes from, it comes into the back of my head sometimes saying, that prayer was too short to count. Is that just me? Or do you ever have that happen where you, you, you take some time, you pray, and the first thought that comes to you when you get up, if you knelt or when you stand up, the first thought that comes to you is, call yourself a prayer warrior. It wasn't even 10 minutes. Anybody else ever have that happen to you? Oh, good. I'm so thankful.
A real man of God would have been on his face for three days. That was just a few sentences. Now look at this story. Between the king's question, what's wrong? Between that question and Nehemiah's answer, he prays. Did you notice it? It's right in the text. It's right in the text. What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and then I said to the king. He's been praying for five months. Now he just fires off a sentence. It's a beautiful thing to see a life so drenched in seasons of prayer that it becomes natural to reach out instantly in times of crisis. That's Nehemiah here. I think this is what Paul meant when he talked about always, praying always, or praying without ceasing. doesn't mean that all he ever did was devotions and nothing else. But, but it, it became the air that he breathed. He was so attuned to a life of prayer that in everything he would just be praying. A consciousness of God, a reaching out to God in everything. Never let the devil quench the impulse to pray let all the daily circumstances of life be fuel for your prayers. Go to God for grace in your time of need, the Bible says. Three. The power of prayer must be backed up by sound character and diligence. Look at 2.5. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight... That you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's grave, that I may rebuild it. Prayer and life tied together. Prayer flows out of who you are before the Lord on a daily basis. Nehemiah didn't just pray for Artaxerxes. Nehemiah did a good job for him every day of his life. If it, Lord, if it pleases the king, if I found favor in your sight... He prays, oh God, give me an opportunity. But he lives in such a way that he has won the favor of the king. And that's what enabled the Holy Spirit to use Nehemiah so powerfully in this great time of deliverance and reconstruction in his nation's history. It was the quality of Nehemiah's work for the king that made the king concerned about Nehemiah's sad face, right? He likes Nehemiah. What's wrong? Nehemiah's diligence at a simple, maybe even boring, daily assignment opened the door for his life-changing conversation with the king. There's great application to our lives. I know it's obvious and it's simple. You pray for your unsaved boss. That's good. Do you do a good job? <laughs> because if you don't, it's going to be a lot harder for God to use you there. Do you show up for work on time? Here's one. Are you content with your pay, like Jesus said disciples were supposed to be? You pray for your kids. Are you a good example in what you watch on TV? You pray for your church. Do you gossip? Do you complain? Do you attend regularly? Do you tithe? You pray for your church. Do your children hear you badmouth other people in the church at home? Now, those are just examples, little examples. But the point is, the power of prayer is greatly magnified when it's linked with the power of godliness and faithfulness. Prayer is powerful when my actions and my prayers don't fight each other. This is actually taught in the Scriptures. The Bible links the power of faith with a good conscience before God. 1 Timothy 1.5 The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And that combination is very powerful. It's a powerful force for God in this fallen world. Here's another verse that talks about the very same thing. 1 John 3.21 and 22 Beloved, if our heart does not if our heart does not condemn us. That's, that's what 
that's what uh, the other text was talking about with faith and a good conscience. That's what Paul meant. A pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. John's talking about the same thing. If our heart doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God. Our conscience is clean. We're not feeling guilty about things. And then he says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments. We do what pleases him. Now, don't, un don't misunderstand that basic verse. It doesn't teach that we earn God's answer to prayer by our good lives. I'm not saying that. Our best deeds can never earn credit with God. But what I am saying is God looks with pleasure on the faith of the one who comes in prayer. And if I'm living a life of just known contradiction to the will of God, where I know I'm not living right and I'm not serving right and I'm not behaving right, then it's very hard for me to pray with faith and expectancy. And, and God doesn't want me short-circuiting my faith in that way. And destroying my own prayer life. Four. When the opportunity opens, Nehemiah gives proper attention to details. Uh, Nehemiah 2, 6 to 8. So the last verse we read was 5, now 6. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone? When will you return? And so it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Now, now notice something. Nehemiah has been waiting on God. He's been praying. God has given him favor with Artaxerxes. And the door opens. After half a year of praying. Now, notice this. That faith in God, on Nehemiah's part, didn't exclude Nehemiah's need to think through the entire situation himself. I know, I know. People always give the example of Abraham. God does sometimes just call someone to act in sheer obedience without giving any thought to the consequences. Just follow me. And Abraham, he's a pretty good example of that kind of raw obedience. And I know there are certain times when God works that way, but I'm here to tell you it's not his normal way of working. You don't need to take my word for it. Just read the rest of the Bible. You'll see it very quickly. Nehemiah doesn't just say, well, praise God, I'm going to go put the walls up, let's go. No. If the walls are going to be rebuilt, even if God is in it, here's what it's going to take, and here are some of the details. Now, those that are going to be serving communion, you guys, you people, can get up and go right now to the back there and get it all ready and just start giving it out. We're doing it just a little bit different tonight for time's sake. But keep just listening to me. It's just going to come by, take the cup and take the bread, and just kind of focus on what we're doing here, all right? So here are the kind of things. Nehemiah has prayed a great deal. He is trusting in God. He does see God work. And at the same time, here's the kind of thing he focuses on. First, Nehemiah gets letters of permission from the king. Why would he get letters of permission from King Artaxerxes? Only one reason. Nehemiah wants it in writing that the king has given him permission because Nehemiah knows in advance that as he goes, he's going to encounter opposition. Right? It's like, why do you take your passport when you go to the airport? Well, because you know they're not going to let you on the plane without it. And you know that's coming, and so you're ready for it. Nehemiah, he gets letters from the king. He asks for it. And he asks for it because he knows as he gets going on his journey, he's going to encounter people like Sanballat and Tobiah who are going to be in his face opposing what he does. He knows many people will question and oppose him once he arrives in Jerusalem. And he's going to need the king's endorsement in writing. Yes, he knows it's God's will. Yes, he knows God is in it. 
Yes, he trusts in the Lord to be with him. But you know what? He's also not stupid. And he knows there are enemies. He knows there is opposition, and it's not likely that the opposition is going to just disappear overnight. He's aware of all that. Now listen. Do you know how many Christians start out in any number of fine Christian ventures, avenues of service and ministry, and they end up surprised? Guess what? Everyone didn't love what they were doing. It happens even in the church. Somebody says, I'll do that. Yeah, there's the ministry there. Yeah, I'll do that. And so they start out. And they'll come by the office. My office, one of the other pastors, they'll come by the office and they'll say, you know, I was just, I was just trying to serve the Lord. And somebody said something Sunday. I just couldn't believe it. Nobody's appreciating me. Nobody thanks me. I just, I'm just trying to serve Jesus here. And I would have thought Christians of all... You know what? Christians are the worst people to be involved with. They're just the worst. Nobody cares. And you kind of step back and you go, you know, you know what, what were you thinking was going to happen? What were you thinking was going to happen? You're, 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 you're serving Jesus. And... There's all sorts of people who will make life hard for you as you serve Jesus. And the church is no exception to that. Let me, let me just tell you now, there's a lot of people in this room involved in all sorts of things in this church. And if it hasn't happened to you yet, it's going to. And this is a good church. This isn't a bad church. This is a really fine church. I'm just saying this. Whenever you start out doing anything for the Lord, anywhere, in the church or out of it, you never get just smooth sailing. So please don't start out in any ministry in the body of Christ thinking, oh, the church is just like heaven working here. Just drop by my office sometime. I got stories for you. That's the way it is. And so he prays. He knows God is with him. He knows God is helping him. And he still thinks through, I need letters of permission. People are going to push back. Don't assume, here's what I'm saying, here's what I'm saying. Don't assume that what you're doing isn't God's will just because it's hard. Here's what else he thinks through. Secondly, he's calculated all the materials he's going to need, not only to start the job, but to finish it. You know what? To do any work, you need materials. Construction takes time. Nehemiah prays. God answers his prayer. God opens the door. It's a miraculous thing that this godless king, Artaxerxes, will send him with letters of permission out of the country that's held him captive back to his homeland to rebuild it. It's a miracle. But Nehemiah doesn't just start doing a dance somewhere before the king. Praise God. Let's get building the walls. Fine, Nehemiah. Now, now how, are you gonna, how are you going to build the walls? How long will it take? How much, how much material will you need to get the job done? Oh. Well, I guess we're going to need timbers. We're going to need wood. So he says to the king, you, you, you talk to the keeper of the forest. Would you let him know that I'm coming? And would you have him have wood ready for me so we can have it on the job site when we actually want to start rebuilding? Because here's what Nehemiah knows. God's not bringing the wood. God opened the door. Nehemiah's getting the wood. Jesus takes a simple account like this. I'm not making it up. And Jesus relates it to our following him in our walk of discipleship. In Luke 24, he says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay, so I want to be a disciple. You want to be a disciple, right? We want to follow Jesus. And so Jesus has some questions. Which of you desiring to build a tower doesn't sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid the foundation 
he's not able to finish. And all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And so here we are, talking about rebuilding different areas of our own lives. And here's one reason why lives remain in rubble. And it isn't because God isn't gracious and forgiving. And it's not because people couldn't, with God's help, get things put back together. And it's not because people don't have just a general desire for things to be nicer than they are right now. A general principle is lives remain in rubble longer than God would like because people fall into this rut where they fail to give attention to important details in the reconstruction process of their lives. After they've repented and after they've prayed, they don't see the importance of all the little steps that would open up their lives to the strong resources of God's helping, renewing grace. Last point. Good work publicly requires God work privately. I'm not going to take time to read it all, but it's that Nehemiah 2, 16 to 17, where he gets up in the middle of the night and he gets on his, his uh, donkey and he rides around and he just looks at the mess in the city. Okay, it's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And nobody knows he's gone. He does it all by himself. As far as we know... As far as we know, this is the first time Nehemiah has seen the mess. He's heard about it. He told Artaxerxes he's heard about it. He's started on his way back. He gets to the city, but then at night he gets up all by himself. And he just, you can see him, can't you? Was the moon shining and he's just plodding around all by himself, looking at this mess. Places where he can't even go, the rubble's too... Everything's too messed up. He's, he's not going to be surprised by the size of the task. He sees all this for himself. First hand. And it gives him time to look at it. I'll tell you what I think he did. He goes around and he sees all of this. And it has to do with what Jesus said about what person, when he starts to build a tower, doesn't think about the cost. He's going and he's seeing it firsthand. Do you think, he's human like we are, do you think he went around and just went, he probably didn't say this, holy mackerel, but do you think he just said, wow, I had no idea. This is a huge undertaking. So when he meets and when he starts, and we'll look at it next week, it's a positive story from here on in. But he starts in such a way that he's not going to approach this task lightly. If there's a huge rebuilding job, he wants to do it thoroughly and get everything set in place. And he trusts in God. He trusts in God. He's got the letters permission from the king. He was ready when the opportunity came. He mourns over the brokenness, the sin that got them there. He's prepared at the the size of the task and he gives attention to all the details and he relies on God. And you'll see in upcoming weeks how that unfolds. Just beautiful potential. Don't start lightly, but don't let that keep you from starting.